welcome and thanks for joining me back in the chicken pen. One of our subscribers asked us to publish a video on mistakes. Now as small holders we don't do everything perfectly and today I'd like to show you some of the things which we did wrong and what we learned from them. Welcome, my name's Fiona. We started the small holding journey a number of years ago and we have made mistakes. We've done some things with the garden design that we would have done differently. We've done some things with the field design that we would have done differently. We've done a lot of things in terms of fruit and veg and keeping chickens and other livestock that we would do differently. Everything that's gone wrong though, we viewed as a learning opportunity. So today I'd like to talk to you about those and tell you what we did differently as a result. These are some of our vegetable beds. When we first started out, these were predominantly carrots, parsnips, broccoli, cabbage, potatoes. Now we live in a very arable area and that means that we can buy those things at the farm gate directly from the farmer at incredibly cheap prices, much, much cheaper than anything you'd pick up in the supermarket. What we can't buy cheaply though is fruit. So we've learned from that and we've actually turned these beds over time over to fruit production. We grow black currants, blueberries, strawberries. We also have a large fruit cage with raspberries and blackberries. We still want some things like potatoes straight from the ground, but what we do now is we grow those in old chicken feed sacks. They're very, very easy to earth up because when you first have them, you just have the sack rolled down and as you earth up gradually, you unroll the sack. When you come to harvest them, you just put a sharp blade down the front, all of the potatoes spill out. It's so, so easy. It also means that we can grow them in protected areas. So they're protected from the wind, so they're less likely to contract blight, which is a major issue for potato farmers. And it also means that if our potatoes get blight, they're less likely to transmit it to the commercial crops. You might also notice that we've got some of these beds with green netting over, and that's to protect the soft fruit. So the one on my left here is blackcurrant, and then we have some further down which have bird netting over which is a, a more loose form of netting and those are protecting strawberries which means that bees can still get in to pollinate all the flowers but the birds can't get in to steal the fruit. One last thing I'd like to point out and I would change this if I could change this now is you'll notice that a lot of these beds are this way in their orientation and then I have this bed behind me here which is in that orientation. Now clearly this bed and the one further back were late additions. We initially had all of these beds in that orientation. We put these two in because we had some ash trees along this line which we had to take out because they became diseased and we decided to use this space for growing. Now why I would change this is I'd move them closer to where I actually am and that's because we had to get rid of our ride-on lawnmower because we couldn't physically fit it around these beds. We measured it so we could get the lawnmower between the beds, but what we can't do is actually turn around the ends. There isn't enough room for the turning circle to move between the different lines. So we would change that. But now we have a different type of mower. We've actually had to exchange the ride on anyway for a commercial push behind lawnmower, which works much, much better here. We did have an issue that the ride on lawnmower had problems over time because we've got lots and lots of hawthorn and blackthorn in our hedging. When we do the hedge cutting, those little bits of branches do fall to the ground and even though our best efforts are into picking up those twigs, we don't get them all, which means there are long thorns 
on the ground which can actually flatten the pneumatic tyres on the ride on mower, which it did on a regular basis. And to be honest, it was a real pain. The commercial lawnmower we've got, which has got a huge cutting deck on it, has um, hard tyres and there is no pneumatic tyres on there at all. So there's nothing to burst. So we've learnt as we go along. Another piece of design that we would have initially changed is where the fruit cage sits. Here we're looking at it directly across part of the chicken enclosure. To the right you'll see some of the fruit and vegetable beds. To the left, when we put the fruit cage in, there was a huge thick hedge line. The previous owners at the property had let the hedge get out of control and there was a very, very thick section of blackthorn. We put the fruit cage in before we cut it back and one winter we got so annoyed with this hedge we just decided that was it, we were going to reclaim some of the land and we were going to dig it out. When I say we, the reality is it was my wonderful husband Hugh who did most of the work because I was actually in an office job at the time during the day. So he did lots of the hard work and I'm very, very grateful to him. Now, we decided to turn it to our advantage in the end. So instead of kicking ourselves that we should have put the fruit cage over to the hedge line a lot more, we extended the chicken enclosure into that new section of field. That's given us a long lobe off the main chicken area. And it's given us a couple of advantages. First of all, that lobe is actually disguised from the gate at the bottom of our field, which goes out onto a public road. And secondly, it gives us an area which allows us to coordinate off very, very easily by putting a small fence across the top end. And we can use this when we've got breeding hens or if we've got a chicken which is not feeling very well and needs to be isolated just so we can keep an eye on it. So initially it looked like a big problem and a huge mistake, but we've actually now turned it to our advantage. This is one of roughly six cherry trees that we have on the property. The six were actually planted very early on in our smallholder days. At the same time we put in apples and pears and we use lots and lots of those in our cooking and our preserving. The cherries, in retrospect, we wouldn't do again. We found that they're very, very difficult to protect the fruit, to net them off in any way, and we lose around two thirds of the crop to the wild bird population. What we do now is when we get the opportunity to plant a new tree, we try something unusual like medlars, or we put in pears and apples. We eat lots of those, so it's always useful to have more. When we first came to our small holding, all of the land was horribly overgrown. This picture doesn't make it look too bad. So let me show you how we cut it down. We got a local farming friend with a flail cutter in. And if you look, those weeds are well above the height of those tractor tires, so they're at least six foot high. We reseeded it and I think you'll see from this picture that the productive field had a great blank canvas. We should have waited though. We quickly realised we need a new septic tank and soak away so all of that reseeding and all of that lovely grass had to come out and it looked like the Battle of the Somme for a while. It was easy to recover and this picture shows the first of our fruit trees in at the top of the field. I learnt from that experience because we tackled the productive land first. We left the flower garden and the ornamental garden till much later because it wasn't as important to us. Here you can see I'm finally getting around to tackling those plants. And now I have a wonderful English cottage garden at the front of our little home. It might surprise you to learn that chickens weren't the first livestock that we kept at the small holding. When we first came here, we always planned to have bees and chickens. We started with bees because we thought they would be easier, but we rapidly realized they were actually incredibly intense. 
they need a lot of maintenance there's a lot of healthcare requirements and when they swarm you have a two-hour window that you have to deal with them you can't just leave it a little bit later because if they disappear they can cause problems for your friends and neighbors and unfortunately i developed quite a bad allergy to bee stings and had to give the bees up and we are in the end very grateful that it happened unfortunately chickens were far easier for us and we found by doing the second it was a great relief the chickens were far easier to keep and when a chicken escaped an enclosure all we had to do was tent them back in with a little bit of grain bees on the other hand would probably take us an hour or so if not more in hot bee suits to get them back into the hive I highly recommend that you do a lot of research but don't give up if one type of animal doesn't work for you it's not the end of the world look at alternatives see what else is out there because bees might suit you they just weren't right for us like most people we started with egg laying chickens we rapidly found though that this was a mistake the eggs which were sold at the gate weren't bringing in enough income to cover the feed for the chickens we wanted them to be self-supporting so we looked around for some other breeds and we finally settled on buff orpingtons which we now breed they bring us three income streams we still sell eggs at the gate for eating. We also sell eggs through the post which are fertilised so other people can incubate them and raise their own chickens. And finally, we sell point of lay hens. We now have two other breeds which we have only for eggs for eating. The first are cream leg bars, which you can see in front of you, and those are grey with salmon pink chests. In addition, we have, we have copper black morans, and they lay chocolate brown eggs. They are fantastic, all three, and I think we found the right mix for us after a poor start. When we first started out, we bought cheap commercial chicken coops. We did what most people do, and actually it's not a bad thing. They do work well, and they do last to a certain extent. However, we've started to build our own because they're not particularly robust. This was one of the first coops that we got, and it's needed lots of repairs over time. It's needed new roof, it's needed a new roof here, it's needed waterproofing to where the lid to the nest box meets the coop itself. We've had to repair this door and put a new door in over time. And you might notice there's a big gap here and that's because the removable floor has had to be removed because it's actually rotted out. So at the moment we're fitting a new baseboard so that there is actually a floor in the coop. Now, if you're prepared to do those repairs, they're not a bad investment. But for us, what we decided to do is build our own. So let's go have a look at one of those. Hello love. This is what we're building now. And when I say we, I mean my lovely husband, because I'm not going to pretend for one minute that I have the carpentry skills that he has. I have other things that I can contribute, but carpentry isn't one of them. This is far more robust than anything you can buy commercially, and it is beautifully made, even if I am just complimenting him, because let's face it, I am biased. This fits, at the moment, we've got seven hens living in here, but it could easily accommodate around 15. And how it's been built is on an old trailer base we've got, and this is another small holder thing which we have learned over time, is that you mend and you make do. You reuse where you can, you repurpose. And this was a trailer where the sides had started to rot out, and it was of no use to us anymore. But the base is still strong and intact and now it can be moved around the chicken pen when we choose to because it is on wheels and it houses these chickens so beautifully and it keeps them warm and it keeps them dry. In 
our films in the chicken enclosure, you might have noticed this old wooden furniture. This is another mistake that we made when we first moved here. We got wooden furniture because it was cheap and it was easily available. We had tables, we had chairs, we had benches, we even had a swing seat and they've all rotted out over time. These four chairs are probably the last remaining remnants of that furniture that we initially had when we came here. We did try and protect it. We used tea coil and it cost us a fortune in tea coil. We've learned from that though and now we have cast aluminium furniture as our main garden furniture. It's cost a little bit more as an initial investment but we've saved in tea coil costs and it'll last an awful lot longer. The chickens also get the benefit of this wooden furniture. They sit on this, they um, hang around on it, it's one of their main gathering places. They absolutely love it and let's face it, it'll last longer with them because they weigh a lot less than I do. In our flower garden we have some iron arches now. When we first moved to the property we put wooden arches in, again because they were cheap and readily available. They looked beautiful but within three years they had rotted out. We had set them in concrete, well postcrete, but they still managed to rot out. We instead, this time to replace them, spent just a little bit more, not a great deal. I shopped around an awful lot and now we have iron arches in place. I then made another mistake and I planted honeysuckle up the arches. Now it was evergreen honeysuckle and it looked wonderful. It was thick and it was lush. Unfortunately, it was very vigorous. And if you didn't keep on top of it on a regular basis, it would just fill the centre of the archway. So you couldn't actually use it as a walkway anymore. I've learnt from that mistake and now I grow roses up them. So the roses grow all during the summer months and autumn and then I cut them down to the ground to reinvigorate them. They look spectacular and the arches are usable. Security in rural areas is a real problem. There's lots of opportunistic thefts. We learnt the hard way. When we first came here we put in security cameras which we thought would be able to do the job and they were, were very cheap. Then we had two of our prize winning Buff Orpington stolen. Now at that point we looked at the security footage and there was two issues. First of all we couldn't look at it till after the event, so long after the chickens had been taken. And the second problem was the footage was such poor quality you had no idea who those individuals were. You could see roughly their size and shape but you had no clue and couldn't see any facial features. It was just dreadful, dreadful quality. What we've done now is dotted a number of these cameras around the place which are from Ring. The big advantages there are, first of all, there's an app on your phone and if you're not at the property, it will actually ping an alert to your phone to let you know that there's motion that shouldn't be happening. So you can check it and take action if necessary. And the second thing is the quality of the footage is absolutely superb. So you can easily identify the individuals and take action, send it on to the police and hopefully they will actually be caught. We learnt the hard way and I would urge you, if possible, to spend a little bit more. I mean, the price of these is coming down a lot. We do prefer Ring. There are others out there, but we prefer the Ring brand. You might think that having heavy gates at the entrance to your small holding is enough to deter anyone from coming in and stealing your things. A neighbour of us, however, had the gates literally lifted off the pins. I don't know whether they had a forklift that they used or they had just a lot of men to lift all at the same time. We learnt from this and we bought this little unit here and all this does is fits over the top of the pin and then you put a padlock through the holes at the bottom which actually means that there's another piece of equipment that anyone coming in to steal from you has to get past before they can get through the gates. Not only would they have to lift the gate off but they'd also have to get rid of this padlock somehow and take the anti-lift unit off. And that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the content. That's some of the mistakes that we've made over time. But I hope that you see that we've tried to learn from that. As small holders, there's lots that's going to go wrong. And all you can do is try your best to turn that into a positive. I hope that helps you as you start your small holder journey.
If you have liked the content, take a moment to give me a thumbs up below. And if you would subscribe and hit the alerts button, you'll get to know of any new videos as soon as they're published. I really look forward to seeing you next time.